All right, welcome back to lecture 12. Um, today we're going to talk about this concept called uh, PCA, also known as principal component analysis. Okay, so uh, before we move on to PCA, I would like to first cover, uh, briefly cover the topic of projection. So to understand, well, not SVM, PCA, we must firstly, uh, first quickly under review, like first, the concept of unit vector. How do you get a unit vector? And what is projection? What is projection? So given a vector u, uh, v, right? This is v at a point c, as well as a vector u, right? That goes all the way to b. So this, this is vector u. The concept of projection is the idea of pretending you have like a sun here, and you're projecting the, the sun hits, creates a shadow from this, uh, from, uh, it hits basically vector V and creates a shadow right here. And you want to know this particular point right here. So projecting is how you create like a 90 degrees, 90, 90 degree angle. Okay? And the way we will say it is we're projecting the vector V onto the vector u. Okay? And the question is, how do you find this point if you know the vector v as well as the vector u? Okay? How do you find this point? So let's start by um, making sure we are on the same page with the unit vector. A unit vector is a vector of length 1. Okay? In the picture shown here, this is not a unit vector. Right, this is three, this is four. So if you know this is three, four, you should uh, have learned, at least in the SAT, that this distance is five. So this obviously is not a length of one. So this is not a unit vector, right? This, on the other hand, is a unit vector. It is perfectly a length, a length of one. So a unit vector is simply a vector with a length of one. Now, if a vector is not a unit vector, we can always convert it. So if this distance is 5, if we divide this portion by 5 and this portion by 5, right, then we're going to get a unit vector right here. This will result to be in the distance of 1. Okay? So let's say, remember, this is the distance 5, right? So if you take the vector 3, 4, remember, this right here is at 3, 4, right? 3, 4, 3, 4. So this vector is at 3, 4. And, and we know that the distance is 5. So if you divide this by 5, then the length is going to end up to be 1. We can see this very clearly because now we can basically see that it's 3 fifth, 3 fifth, and 1 fifth. It's uh, somewhere over here, right? Now, if you were to try to find the hypotenuse of this, then it will be 3 fifths square and then 4 fifths square, resulting in 1, if you calculate that. So the idea here is very simple. When you have a, a vector that is not a unit vector, you can always divide it by the length of the vector so that it would become, right? So this, this vector now has a length of 1. This process of converting a longer and larger vector into a unit vector is called vector normalization. So this is called normalization. Now, when a vector v is normalized, we normally like to denote it with v hat. So v right here is a, v right here is a vector. But if you normalize it to a length of 1, we tend to write v hat on this. Now quickly, like what you want to see is, let's see, quickly see if you can get the unit vector from this, right? If this is the unit vector, then how do you get the normalized version? Well, it's pretty easy. You would essentially do 1 over square root of 3 square plus 1 square times 3, 1. That's how it gives us 3 divided by square root of 10, 1 divided by square root of 10. Right, so this gives us the unit vector. All right, 
Now that you understand unit vector, then we can now understand the concept of projection, which when you project V onto U, our goal is to essentially find this point. Okay? So that's, that's the concept of projection. And the idea is um, you want to find the, so you, right, if you know the distance from zero to you, then, then that will be this distance right here. We're going to call this distance alpha. Okay. So the distance, uh, did I call alpha? I should call this alpha. So the idea is actually really, really simple. If you have a vector u, right? And let's say we can find a unit vector of u. So the unit vector of u is here, u hat. Well, this point, it's simply u hat times some alpha value. So if this is one, right? If this is five, if this is five, so one times five would reach this point. So basically, if you have one unit vector, you can always make it longer until you reach this. And the way you make it longer is by multiplying by some number, right? Two would double it, three. And it turns out that you know how to find the unit vector. And to find the alpha, all you have to do is take the v vector and dot the u vector. So v dot u hat. So if you just take the dot product of v and u hat, then this gives you alpha. Okay, so you can see here, if you simply dot v dot u hat, you just dot them together, right? After you dot them together, it gives you, sorry, alpha value. And the alpha value over here, uh, so, okay, so let's, let's take a quick look. So over here we have what? U, U is 4, 2, right? 4, 2. So that's U, U. And first thing we want to do is to normalize U. To normalize U, you just divide by the length. So what is the length? 4 square plus 2 square. So it's 1 over square root of 20, right? That's where I got this from. So, so now I have u hat. Once I have u hat, to find alpha, you dot u hat with v. Okay? So this is u hat over here and here, and you dot it with v. Once you do this, then, then the alpha value is 3.13. If you know the alpha value, you just multiply 3.13, right? Now that we have u, right? If you, It's saying that if you multiply u by 3.13, you're going to reach this point. So let's see what happens. We take u hat, multiply by 3.13, which give us 2.8 and 1.4, okay? So does it make sense? 2.8. 1.4. See? So now we essentially have the coordinate of D. We know exactly the location where that's supposed to be. Okay? So let's do a quick practice. Why don't you try pausing the video? You want to project. This is U and this is V. You want to project U onto V and see if you can find a point D. Okay? So, so you can use NumPy to do this. Pause the video. Try to do it. And we're going to move on. Now, to understand the concept of PCA, we must first understand several other things. One is called data centering, which requires us to use the centering matrix. Now, we've gone through variance and covariance before, but we'll do a quick review. Okay? Once you understand that, then we'll cover the covariance matrix. Okay? So the first way to center a matrix, right? well, you can basically... Like, if you're trying to center a matrix, which you have multiple points, and you're trying to move this to the center, to 0, 0, 0, the way you do it is you find the average point, which could be like here, and you just subtract everything from the average point. Right? So you will take the first sample, subtract the average point, second sample, subtract the average point. So by doing this, you will move the, this data to the center. And this is called centering. Just in case you have any doubt why it's called centering, 
This is the original data. Once you subtract the average from the data, you essentially move it to the center, hence centering. So let's look at a really quick example. Here's our data x, right? So if you have the data x, then what is the average point? Well, this will be 4 divided by 3. This will be 3 divided by 3. So this is the center point right, between uh, the two dimensions. Once you have the center point, what you want to do is you want to take each, cent each point, subtract the center. Take this, subtract the center. Take this, subtract the center. So we're subtracting the center away. Once you've subtracted the center, then the impact is what you see here. You move this over here. So, so the cloud is now in the center of the data. Hint centering. So we've actually done this before. When we do the preprocessing, we will center and scale the data. right? So the idea of centering should not be too foreign for you. So the reason why we're talking about centering is because there's a second way to do centering. And this second way, if you understand it, makes life a lot, a lot easier, okay? So the second way to do centering is instead of taking x and subtract the center of x, what you can do is just take x and multiply a centering matrix, okay? And we're going to go over the derivation of how the centering matrix works, all right? So let's say this is your data, and each sample is just one single row. So you have like n and n samples. So if you want to subtract the center of this, you need to first find the center, right? So how do you find the center? Well, to find the center of each dimension, two, three, these are the dimensions, you simply look at all these numbers, add them up, and divide by n, right? So you sum all of them up, sum this entire vector up, and then divide it by n. So to find the center of this, like I said, you will take the vector, this column vector right here, and basically multiply a vector of once. Notice how when you multiply by a vector once, it adds every element up, and then you divide it by n. So this right here will essentially give you the center, the, the, the average value of this entire column. And then you can do that again for the second column, all the way to the last column. So this right here is how you will find the center point for every single dimension, right? The average point. Well, once you have the average point, right, then the average point for dimension one all the way to dimension D. So, well, notice how they're all multiplying by one over N. Well, this is just a constant. So we can pull one over N outside, right? If we pull one over N outside, we can also pull this vector outside because everything is one over N. So you can pull all of these outside, and the residual is this matrix. And guess what? This is our original matrix X, right? This is the same, same matrix. Therefore, therefore, you can find the center. You can find the center, center of the, um, each dimension simply by taking the X times the vector of ones, which we denote, we denote the vector of ones with this notation, divided by N. And you take the center, multiply by vector one, divide, and this will give you a centering. Uh, this will give you the the center of each dimension, right? So th this will be like a vector that looks like this, where this will be the center of the first dimension, right? Vector that looks center of the first dimension, right? The center, center of the second dimension, so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. So. Well, now that, now that we know how to find the center, remember, to find the center, what we want to do is we want to make multiple copies of the center. Because for every single sample, we're going to subtract the center away. All right? So take this sample, we subtract the center away. And this one, we subtract the center away. So the qu next question is, now that we have all the centers of every single dimension, how do we make a copy? Well, the way you can make a copy, like let's say you have a bunch of numbers, one, two, three, um, and you want to make a copy of this, like lots of rows, so that it looks like one, two, three, one, two, three. So how do you go from a 
a horizontal vector to make a copy. Well, all you have to do is multiply vector of ones, right? If it's vector of two, then it's going to make two copies. So notice how when you take the outer product, it becomes one, two, three, one, two, three. So you just made two copies of this, right? So for us, we need to make n copies because they're n samples. For every single sample, we need to subtract the average point away. So if we need to subtract the average point away for every single sample, then we just need to multiply our center point by a vector of ones size of n, right? Because if it's size two, it makes two copies. If they're size n, it makes n copies. So since this right here has n samples, you, get, you need to make n copies, right? So you can subtract the center away from n number of points. So now you can see that, remember, this is the center, which we calculated right here. So we can now plug this equation over here, right? Now, if I plug that equation, this is just a one, right? So this goes here, and this equation goes right here. So that, that they're the same thing. So this was the centering point. We calculated the center previously. So the matrix that that after centering is essentially x minus copies, many, many copies of the many, many copies of the center. Now, this right here is a vector of ones like this and times one over n, and then you have a vector of ones. And then you have the x matrix, right? So this is a constant. We can move this to the right. So now we end up with 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 over n, x. Because it's a constant, we can move this out. Now, what is 1 times 1? Well, that's just a matrix of 1s. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, lots of 1s, x. We're going to denote this matrix as 1, 1, 1, 1, transpose. So, 1, 1 transpose, like this. This implies that now we copy this over here so that we have, have 1 of n, which we moved out, 1, 1 transpose, which is this, times x. Well, this right here is x. This right here is x. This means we can pull them out as well. After we pull them out, notice how we just have 1x x times identity is x, and this multiplied by this will result in this. So from here, we can now pull out x. And therefore, what this is saying is that this is our original x matrix. And if we multiply the x matrix by some matrix here, this is a matrix, it will give us the centering. It's equivalent to subtracting the average point away from every single point. And therefore, the definition of the centering matrix is the identity matrix subtract one over n a matrix of ones, right? Matrix of ones. So that's that's a second way of how you can centering the data. Okay, that's the second way. And and um, like it's it's kind of initially you see a lot of math, so it's hard to believe. But let's say we have this data, which I showed you previously. You can calculate the center, make copies of it, and subtract it away. So this is, the, this is the result if you had used the initial strategy one. Now, I want you to identify the centering matrix, calculate out the center matrix, and then multiply Cx. Because once you multiply this out, this should be equivalent to this, meaning that you can calculate uh, you can remove the center either by physically removing the center or you can multiply X by the center matrix, right? And this approach drastically simplifies calculation later on, later on. So, so you, I want you to pause the video and see if you are able to essentially, essentially convince yourself that when you calculate C, multiply by X, you're going to get the same result back, okay? Pause the video. Uh, I'm going to move on. All right, so the interesting thing about the centering matrix is that the centering matrix is symmetric. So if you 
take the transpose of it, it's equivalent to itself. Another thing is the centering matrix multiplied by itself is just the centering matrix. And this makes a lot of sense. This is because if you have the data, right, if you multiply the data by centering matrix, your data is going to be here, right? It's going to be in the center. But if you move this, multiply it again by the centering matrix, then it's going to stay here. Therefore, if you have X, you center it, right? Then it's going to be here. But if you center it again, it's still going to stay here, implying that centering twice or three times and four times, it's equivalent to centering just once. Okay, so centering just once. And you should try these two properties together, right? So here is the center matrix. Pause the video. See for yourself that the centering is equal to its transpose. And calculate yourself that the centering multiply by another center matrix is just equal to the original center matrix. Okay? Pause the video. Give this a try. All right. So... Hopefully, you are now have a better appreciation of how the centering matrix work. Next, we need to go over some matrix multiplication on the concept of vectors of vectors. So we now know what a vector is. Like, right, you have basically a bunch of numbers enclosed within a bracket. However, I would like to... Uh, introduce the concept of having a vector v1, v2, v3 inside a vector. So these are vectors inside a vector. Therefore, they're just matrices, right? So if v1 is like this, v2 transpose, right? v3, and then you put them in the bracket. So vectors of vectors in this particular case are just matrices. However, you can picture matrices also as vectors of vectors. So here's an example. Let's say here, right, we have four vectors. And we can stack these four vectors this way, such that each vector is, goes like this, horizontally. We can also stack vectors this way, like y, right? So it's stacked this way, vertically. So now you can imagine if this is x, this is y, then x times y is equal to x times y, okay? Now, previously, we would be doing multiplication between matrices. However, now you are doing multiplication between vectors. So now you can pretend you're doing an outer product, right? So the outer product, then you just take this, multiply by this, 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 this. So this is the outer product. So what I'm saying here is if you had treated this as an outer product, as if each vector is really just an element. Just pretend each vector is an element. And if you had done it that way, then this would have been equivalent to had you just multiply matrix, matrix multiplication. Okay. So, so another way to look at it, so that was x, y. What about we flip it? So now we, y times x. So we flip the two. So now it looks like this. If you do it this way, now it's an inner product, inner product, inner product, right? So if you have the inner product, that then it would be x times x transpose, see? And then y times y transpose, or w times trans. Therefore, what I'm saying is you could have done a matrix multiplication. Could have just done that. You would get the same result. However, if you picture them, picture them as uh, vectors of vectors, then you can do an inner product on them, and the result will be equivalent. Why don't we test this idea out? Let's say, let's say you have x1, x2, and we define x as x1 is here, x2 is here, right? So if you take x transpose x, right? So what was x? x is, uh, x is equal to this, and x transpose is this. So if you multiply them together using the, the as vectors of vectors, so using dot product, if you did that, then this right here would be x1 times x1 transpose, x2 times x2 transpose. So what I want you to do is first, 
I want you to calculate this as if they're matrices. And then I want you to calculate this as if they are uh, vectors of vectors, right? So if you calculate this, they should be identical. However, they're different because you're looking at one as a matrix multiplication, while the other one is a vector multiplication, right? So you can treat vector, like and vector multiplications are easier to think of than matrix. Okay. So try this, try this exercise. Oops. Try. Here we go. Try this, pause the video, try this exercise, and uh, we're going to move on. All right. So the ability for you to essentially be able to look at a ma uh, matrix as vectors of vectors uh, really, really simplifies a lot of things. Right? especially when there's a lot of summation. So I'll give you an example. Over here, this is a multiplication of um, vectors. So you have n vectors, and you're doing uh, outer products, and you're summing them all together. Right. So this right here, you will have to put like a, in a for loop. Right. For every single element, you multiply by its outer product, then you add them together. So this you can picture as an ma addition of matrices in a for loop. However, however, this right here is equivalent to x1 times x1 transpose, right? x2 times x2 transpose, so on and so forth. Now that you know we can pull them out, now that you know we can pull them out, then this is equivalent to the inner product of the two of them, right? This, notice how this multiplied by this give you this. This multiply this give you this. So now we can picture this as an inner product of two vectors of vectors. And guess what? Our x was defined this way. Our x is x1, x2, right? Therefore, this is just x, and this is x transpose. Therefore, if you're trying to find, if you're trying to find this summation, you could just one at a time add up x1 times x1 transpose, right? You can just you could just add them up one at a time. Or you could just multiply two matrix together and they would be equivalent. Alright, and this is much this is a much better and superior way to do this. Okay. So now that we see this, we can further extend this idea. So this right here is xi times xi, but what if it's xi subtract the center and xi subtract center? So instead of x, it will be x subtract the center and x times subtract the center, right? So we, we just showed you how this works. If you made it a little bit more complicated, then it's no longer x, is x subtracting the center, x subtracting the center, right? So this, these two are equivalent. And you may recognize you may recognize this formula right from from previous examples. Now, once you have this, we can further simplify it because we can move the transpose inside. So after we move the transpose inside, then it becomes x transpose c transpose, right? This becomes this. So x transpose c transpose, right? What is interesting is I told you that C transpose is just equal to C. And that C times C is just equal to C. This implies that this whole thing is just equal to 1C. And this expression becomes X transpose CX. So we have this relatively complicated expression that you would have, you, you would have, to calculate this, you would have take the center. You, I mean, sorry. You would take each sample and subtract the center, center, multiplying by it again, and then in a for loop, you would have had to calculate them over and over again to, to sum it up. Instead, you can do this entire thing simply, simply by multiplying three matrix together, right? This requires a lot of code. This requires very little bit of code. Much, much easier implementation, okay? All right, so let's let's further ex extend this idea. So this right here, 
like I just told you, x minus this is equivalent to this, this expression. If we follow this logic, if we follow the same logic, then over here is x minus x bar, x minus x bar. But what if we have x minus x bar times y minus x bar? What if we have that? Well, if we define x this way and y this way, the only thing that changes is this right here. All right, so we, you would, we will replace this x with y, right? So over here, this is x minus x bar. This is y minus y bar. So I'm going to denote this as x hat because uh, that's x hat is something that's already subtract the center. So it's a summation of xi uh, times yi transpose, okay? And once again, I told you we this is equivalent to this times this, right? This is the inner product. They, they are equivalent. And what is x? What is x hat? Well, x hat is just c subtracting the center away. I mean, sorry, x subtracting. So it's x subtract the center away. Is this right here, right? And then this one here is y subtract the center away. Therefore, therefore, we can move the c in the center again. C disappears. This expression is now x transpose cy. So once again, this is something that would be complicated to code if you don't understand how it transfers into just a bunch of matrix multiplication. Okay. All right. So, so this is this is a lot of math so far. Let let's next review the concept of variance and covariance. Variance given a set of scalar variables. So these are these are variables. Now remember in, from previous lecture what the concept of variance is. Well, a variance is the average distance from the center. So notice I subtract the point from the center. Right. So this is the distance from the center square, right? Distance from the center square. So you are finding the average of the distance from the center square. So if the distance is very far, then you're going to have a large variation. However, if the distance from the center is very thin, then you have a smaller one, right? So, so this, the variance tells us that on average, the distance from the center. Now, covariance, on the other hand, tells us the dependency. So the equation is almost identical. It's almost identical. But they're different in that covariance tells you if you have a high covariance, implies that if one value is more likely to be above the average, the other value is also more likely to be above the average. So that, that's how you end up with a large covariance. Okay? So... This is covariance, and you notice that the equation is almost the same, where this is xi minus x bar, xi minus x bar. So the difference between variance and covariance is that you replace this with y. Okay? Therefore, variance is just covariance with itself. Right? If you have put x here, then that's, that's with itself. All right, so the covariance matrix is the next concept. So now that you understand covariance, what is the covariance matrix? Well, covariance allows you to measure the dependency between two variables, right? X1, X2. However, what if you have more than two, like three, four, five, six variables, right? So in this particular example, we have three, right? We have three here. In this three example, right? How will we go about finding their dependence? Well, we find the dependence by measuring the covariance of every single combination, hence the covariance matrix. So if we have x1, x2, x3, what this matrix tells you is that you have the covariance of x11, x12, x13, right? x21, x22, x3. Basically, um, the entire uh, 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 combination, uh, uh, combinatorial between like all uh, x1 to 3 to x1 to 3. Therefore, if you have three variables, it will be 3 by 3, right? If you have 100, it will be 100 by 100. And you know previously that covariance of x1 
x1 is just the variance itself. So the diagonals are all the variance, and the off diagonals are the covariance. Okay. Now, computing covariance, well, now that you know how to calculate variance, so you could calculate that for x1, variance x2, x3, right? And then you know how to calculate covariance as well. So technically, you will be able to just calculate every single one of them. And of course, that would be very uh, a very a lot of work because this is only three and you need to do nine of them. You can imagine 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, right? So then you have to calculate a million numbers just to fill the matrix. And that would not be that would not be efficient. And there's a much, much better way to calculate the covariance matrix. Okay. Now, this is to calculate the covariance matrix, right? Notice, let's say you have two data that's already centered, already centered. So each sample are centered already. Now, remember previously they are equivalent to um, Vectors of vectors. So this one over n carries over, so they are the same. And this right here is equivalent to vector times vector. And this is the outer product. When you calculate outer product, what happens is you multiply this, 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 and you end up with this outer product. Okay? So this actually turns into inner product. Once you have this expression, what is this? Well, this is the average. No, no, this is x1. Right, subtract the center way for every single value. So summed up. So it's summing up all the values subtracting from variable one, from variable one. So for variable one, notice this is simply the equation of variance of x1, which is right here. And notice this one is x1, x2. So this is calculating the covariance of x1, x2. Right, and so on and so forth. This is calculating the covariance of two and one, right? Two and one. So when you when you multiply when you multiply two center matrix together, it automatically calculates this entire matrix, right? You don't want to calculate these one at a time, which would be a lot of calculation. Instead, just by multiplying two matrix together, you get the entire matrix. Okay? This is this is why your ability to, to model matrix as vectors of vectors could really, really make your life easier. All right? And as so we previously saw, what is this? Well, this right here, one of n, this is just C X transpose C X, right? This is the center. So this creates a center. So this right here then is 1 over n, x, c transpose c, x, c combines together. Therefore, therefore, we can calculate the covariance matrix using this. So this right here is the covariance matrix. Much, much easier to calculate than if you had calculate the variance of every dimension, covariance of every combination, right? This is, this is much, much easier to calculate. Okay, well, now we're, okay, now we've done a lot. Now we're ready to move on to the concept of a PCA, right? To, if you want to understand PCA, right, often, like, certain dimension of the data are just noise, and you don't really need them. The idea of PCA is to reduce the dimension of the data by removing less important dimension of the data, okay? When the dimension is reduced, then we have less data to deal with less memory to store on the computer. Our algorithms will be faster because we're using less data, and the noise of the data will be removed. So there's a lot of pros why you want to remove the useless dimensions within your data. So example would be, here's your PCA. You start with four dimensions or any other number, like 100 dimensions, and you end up with like two dimensions. For example, you could end up with three or one. We'll show the easiest example today on just one dimension, right? So, so the idea of PCA is, is pretty simple. If you want to reduce the dimension of the data, what you could do is you can project the data into a line. So if you project onto a line, then the data simply live in one dimension now. It no longer lives in two dimensions. 
and you just need to keep this one dimension and one with this just one dimension that's how you lower that's how you lower the the the, the dimension yeah so the idea of pca is that when you pick a dimension a vector to project down to you want to pro- find a vector such that after the projection the data looks very similar to the original you want to preserve the original shape right it makes sense you want to remove the dimension such that the data looks the same implying that you haven't really removed like implying that you really uh, preserve the data as much as possible right imagine had you picked this vector to project down to then you're going to end up like this right after you do all the projection now this obviously does not look like the original data right this does this look does a pretty good job of preserving the original nature and shape of the data so the idea of pca is essentially for you to find a vector such that after you do the projection the shape look rough, roughly the same okay so that is the insight and the key observation is that after the projection right if if you the projections dimension is really uh, sorry the variance is very large right notice this variance large but this particular case the variance is small based on this insight right we can conclude that if you project after you do the projection the the variance along this dimension if it's very very large that does a good job of preserving it and if it's very small it does a poor job of res, uh, reserving uh, conserving the shape right so remember variance variance in high dimension in high dimension when we have multiple dimensions is the covariance matrix is the covariance matrix okay so therefore if you were to take if you were to take the data right sorry if you take the data and if you were to project onto some vector right remember the projection right you project onto a vector if you were to project the data onto some vector and then you find the covariance of that or the variance after that right if you can find a vector that maximizes the variation the variance if you can find a vector that maximizes the variance then then you uh, essentially would have found the correct vector so that's the point of pca is that you're trying to find a vector such that after the projection right and then it lives on this line that the variance is maximized okay now well if you have that's that's if you have one dimension you have multiple dimensions then it will be the covariance matrix and we just just figure out what the covariance matrix is it's this equation this is the covariance matrix and for every single sample right so over here you have x1 x2 x3 so on and so forth and this is the vector you want now remember you can get the distance alpha you can get the distance alpha if you project x1 transpose v right that gives you alpha so it tells you exactly how far the distance is for every single point right it tells you how far every point is so if you just times v by x1 x2 x3 this will give you the alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 essentially how far you go the location of each one right and by therefore therefore if you project the data so this is after you project the data and then you calculate the variance so you're trying to find a vector such that after projection the variance and the covariance matrix right to- in totality is maximized then you would have preserved the original shape really, really really well so that's the idea of pca okay now now this right here finding like this requires us to use a unit vector right remember that when you do a projection you have to use a unit vector finding unit vector is quite difficult 
So in general, we relax this, so we find just just a v. However, we add a constraint. The constraint is v times v equals to zero, or equals to one, right? Remember, unit vector implies that v times v is equal to one, right? Therefore, if this is not equal to one, then this is going to add a negative value. So if you have a negative value, then you are not achieving your maximum, right? It's maximum when this right here is zero, so it's not hurting it. So this right here is the is the additional constraint that allows us to find a vector. Now we we previously seen this before, right? There is a closed form solution. We can simply take the derivative of this and set it to zero. So. To simplify the notation, I'm just going to call this Q, right? So therefore, this is this whole thing is just V Q V V transpose V minus one. Okay. So once again, the reason why we added this is because if if we want this to be zero, if it's not zero, it will give us a negative value, and when it's a negative value. It essentially hurts our maximization. So when you're running gradient descent or when you're trying to solve this, you need to make like it allows it avoids solutions that is not uh, normalized. Okay. So how do we find the derivative of this? The derivative of this, well, this is a quadratic, so it's two q, and this right here is also quadratic, so it's lambda two v. So in this particular case, once we find the derivative, if you we can find a closed form solution by setting it to zero. And when we set this to zero, it turns out that the solution matches the definition of eigenvalue eigenvectors. Like we went, we did a previous class on that. So if you remember eigenvalue and eigenvector, this is the solution. So, so um, when you have eigenvalue eigenvectors, you end up having a lot of them, how do you know which eigenvector to pick? Well, you want to pick the eigenvector that has the largest eigenvalue because you're trying to maximize this. So you want to pick the vector with the largest eigenvalue. Okay. So that's it. That that's basically the solution to PCA. Is once you have Q, you pick the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. And if you want to project it to two dimensions instead of one, you'll pick two of the largest eigen uh, vectors with the largest eigenvalue. So two largest eigen, two most dominant eigenvectors. Okay. So over here, I did a I did an example for you. You can basically step through, and by doing this example, we find we find the centering matrix, we find the Q, we find the Q matrix, and then. After you perform um, uh, eigen decomposition, you should get a line that looks like this. So you want to step through this this very simple example. Like step through it, make sure you understand. Okay. And then once you have v, right, the the low dimension you achieve is you multiply v by the matrix, and this is your low dimension. Right. So you went from two dimension down to one dimension. Right. In one dimension, it looks like this. Okay, PCA down to multiple. Di okay, we, we talked about multiple dimension. Um, how many dimensions should you reduce the data down to? Well, let's say you have a high dimensional data, like 100 dimensions. How do you know how many dimensions you should reduce it down to? Well, you can simply look at the eigenvalues. The eigenvalue tells you the contribution of how much each eigenvector has. So over here, you can see it's saying that V3, V4, all the way to V infinity have zero contribution, right? Zero, zero, zero contribution. In this case, you just need to keep like the first two. And by having the first two, that will give you 100% of the contribution. And that will be good enough. The span will be equivalent, okay? All right, so um, for for PCA, it's actually I wrote the code for PCA from scratch, right? But you can also run PCA this way. 
This simply tells you how many dimensions you want to re reduce it down to. And after the transformation, it gives you the actual reduced. All right, so that's the video for today. Um, I want you to make sure you practice this last example, see if you can do PCA, and see if you are able to find a, find a good projection that makes sense. All right, thank you very much. I'll see you later.